My name is Camper English, and welcome to this latest chat sponsored by Beverage. Some of you might be watching on YouTube, while others might be watching um, on Beverage.co. Uh, either way, I encourage you to uh, take a look at the Beverage website and uh, check out what's going on. They have some tasting kits on offer. The first one launching this March is on American Single Malt Whiskies and that allows you to explore the range of that spirit category. So just a bit of housekeeping before we start uh, tonight's discussion about whiskey on ice. Uh, I wanted to point out in your uh, little sidebar, if you're watching on beverage.co, you'll see a little chat box, and that is for conversations amongst yourselves. There is the question mark, it looks like a help box, but it's actually for asking questions of the panelists if we don't get to something during the talk. And then there's a little survey uh, icon that you can click on and uh, we'll see if anybody puts something in there. And um, these talks, there have been a bunch of them over the last several months on spirits, trends, tasting, how-tos, whiskey investing, businesses, history, and more. And tonight we're gonna get to the cold hard truth and that is ice. If you think an hour is a long time to talk about ice, uh, I've been doing it for about 10 years now. So uh, there, we might not get through everything in this hour despite uh, the seemingly small topic. Uh, to introduce myself before we get to our panelists, my name is Camper English. I am a journalist. Uh, by web my main website is alcademics.com and I have tons of stuff uh, about ice spanning more than a decade there. And um, it's my specialty topic more than anything else in cocktails and spirits. And uh, so now I'll have our other panelists introduce themselves. Uh, next up is uh, Aaron. Hello, my name is Aaron Goldfarb, uh, coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm a journalist also, and I write for websites like Punch, Fine Pair, Esquire and other fine websites uh, and magazines. And I'm also an author. I've written about 10 books of uh, various uh, topics and quality. <laughs> and uh, probably the most notable one is hidden behind Camper's head if he starts bobbing and weaving. It's called Hacking Whiskey. Came out in uh, 2018, I believe, and uh, got a few new ones coming out since then that hopefully Camper will ask me about and I can seamlessly plug. <laughs> yeah, so uh, speaking of plugging your upcoming books, <laughs> I, I, know, I know of two more in the works. Uh, there, are there more than two? <laughs> no, there's, uh, there's in, no. In, in October of this year, my book, Brand Mysticism, which I wrote with Steve Grass, the um, owner of Tamworth Distillery, which is a cool craft distillery in New Hampshire. He's kind of a branding guru. So that book's about, you know, how do you literally make an alcohol brand? Uh, that, that'll be coming out in October this year. And what you've also heard about is my upcoming book on dusty booze, of which I've written zero words. So look, don't talk to me too much about that. Okay. And, and that's about people who seek out vintage. Vintage uh, spirits. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. And I'm sure in a, you know, a year or more, that'll be an interesting <laughs> chat to, uh, to host here on Beverage. Um, so uh, let's introduce our... Third panelist, going through the countdown now. There we are. Hello. Um, yeah, I am Anu Apte. I am a bar owner. I um, my bar, my baby that I've had for 13 years is called Rob Roy, and I ha also have Navy Strength, Tradewinds Tavern, and Vinny's Wine Shop, all in the Belltown area of Seattle, and all with different ice programs. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Much, much to talk about there then. So uh, uh, Rob Roy, I'm sure will be um, a, a big focus of this. Uh, Rob Roy is named after? Rob Roy is named after the classic cocktail, 
Um, it actually, so I actually did not name the bar. It was formerly a bar named Viceroy. Um, and they actually had to change the name. And so they like, they didn't want to ruffle too many feathers, like confuse their guests. So they chose a name that was similar. So they chose Rob Roy and they were also wanting to like get back to focus on classic cocktails, but it was only three months after, um, they changed the name that they sold the bar and, and I was the person there that swooped it up <laughs> oh, nice. and, and then I kept the name. And what is in a Rob Roy? Well, okay. it's a scotch based Manhattan essentially, right? So you have scotch of your choice, sweet vermouth, bitters, and then I like to say that the garnish is up to you. Some people are very particular about their garnish, but I like, you know, I think it really depends on what scotch you're using. Okay. Well, how, uh, what, what are you in the, which style of Rob Roy would you be in the mood for right now? <laughs> oh, oh, oh goodness. Okay. It's been a long week. It's Seattle cocktail week. It's been a long week and it's only Wednesday, right? But it yes. feels like it's Saturday. Um, well, since I have like half a week to go, I would probably do a 50-50. Um, you know, I had a really amazing Rob Roy made by Joaquin Phoenix. At, um, sorry, Joaquin Phoenix, the actor. No, no. <laughs> I wish, but both, both in the same room together would be even better. Uh, <laughs> see, it's been a long week. Um, but he did like a split base with, uh, so kind of a perfect Rob Roy, a split base with sweet vermouth and dry vermouth. And then just a good blended scotch. So, um, it was just, it's really elegant and really lovely. One of my favorite scotches that I loved making Rob Roy's with was the feathery, which is no longer produced. Um, so if you have a bottle of that around, do a two to one, that that was like my ultimate favorite. But now talk to me on Friday and I'll probably do like a Laphroaig <laughs> with like just a couple of drops of vermouth and some bitters. <laughs> it changes all the time. And is a, a Rob Roy typically served up or on ice? It typically is served up. So if you were to walk into a bar and ask for a Rob Roy, they'll probably make it for you up unless it's a, you know, a real craft focus bar and they'll ask what you like. Um, but so again, for me, it depends on what base spirit you're using. If you want that little added dilution, if you want it on the rocks, if they have beautiful clear ice, you know, if we come over to your house camper, I might ask for it on a nice big ice cube. Excellent. So uh, speaking of uh, drinking whiskey on the rock or rocks, um, Aaron, uh, when you are drinking different whiskeys, let's say scotch whiskey, bourbon, rye, et cetera, what, do you have a personal preference or guideline? Do you usually drink one or the other uh, on ice? <laughs> or always well, As we said backstage, I didn't realize I was in an ice seminar till like one day ago. <laughs> I never drink whiskey on ice. <laughs> uh, you have written about it. <laughs> no, I, I drink cocktails on ice, obviously, but uh, whiskey itself, I always drink neat. Excellent. I, I think I do uh, different different formats for different whiskeys, uh, depending on the, the proof, the style. Uh, personally, when I go for uh, bourbon, I tend to think of that, most of it, not all of it, as an easy drinking whiskey, and I'll throw it over an ice cube and while I'm sure. watching TV or something. Whereas maybe at a cocktail bar, where I want to slow the pace down and do some slow sipping. That's when I'm going uh, neat. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, when you visit Kentucky and they make you start drinking at like 8 a.m., sometimes you do need the big glass of ice with just a little bourbon over it, and I, which I think they call uh, Kentucky tea there. Just a lot of a lot of ice and some bourbon. That's a light drink there, so. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, speaking of different, um, the functions of ice, um, I wondered if Aaron, you can sort of give us the, the gist of that. Does ice only make things cold? Uh, no, I mean, I have nothing against a cold drink. You know, why I don't like ice in when I'm drinking spirits by themselves is because of dilution. Obviously, you can get superior ice at Camper's House that is going to dilute slower than, you know, the crap coming out of my fridge. Um, still, I'd rather 
just not have to deal with any dilution at all, except in cocktails, of course. So we have, um, you know, ice. So that's two functions of ice that's doing right there. It's it's both chilling and it's diluting, and we know those are related because uh, in order for the drink to get colder, some of the ice has to melt. Um, and uh, there's some interesting science about that in Dave Arnold's book, Liquid Intelligence, as I'm sure all of us here have read cover to cover many times. It's been very uh, useful for that. Um, and the also when we add ice to whiskey, um, like for example, in judging whiskeys, uh, are we adding water or ice then, uh, Aaron, in your experience? You know, I I never get invited to those big, massive judging things that everyone hears about. You you know, get your five hundred bucks and have to have like seventy vodkas. But um, you know, I guess I do blind tastings occasionally for websites and magazines. And you know, neat, sure, maybe some water added to see what happens. I I can't recall ever adding ice in terms of you know battling twenty bourbons against each other to see what happens. I suppose you could. Um, and then I don't know what you do, sit around and wait for it to dilute. And I, I don't know, again, you know, I'm a bad guest. I, I don't, I don't drink ice except in cocktails. <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, the other thing, um, with that chilling, uh, of, of the whiskey, there's a little bit of, uh, numbing going on in the palate, um, which, um, if, there are a lot of people who put ice in beverages they don't want to taste as strongly. <laughs> and it may not be just the dilution, but actually what's going on uh, with our tongue. Um, Anu, how do you generally uh, drink your different whiskeys? Do you, are you uh, a rocks person, always neat? Are you purist like Aaron? I, um, I ebb and flow. I, I do different things. Again, it, it depends on the quality of the whiskey and where I am, right? So if I'm just at a dive bar and I know it's like a well, like a decent, well, I feel like most people have a decent well bourbon or rye at this point. I never order well scotch. I don't care where you are. <laughs> just, just don't do that. Um, well, you can at Rob Roy, but anywhere else, I don't know. Um, I enjoy it both. I enjoy neat. I do what, so if I get a new bottle of somebody sending me a sample of something, like when we were talking about, uh, tasting, just blind tasting for people, uh, I've never tried ice either again, cause you kind of have to wait too long, but yeah, definitely adding a little bit of dilution, um, and also tasting it neat. Um, but if somebody were to send me a bottle to the bar to taste, I will taste it on the rocks because I want to know what the experience would be like for a guest who orders it on the rocks. So I'll taste it and be like, what type of rocks should this go on? How much dilution? Say it's a, a, a bottled cocktail. Cause right now we can still sell cocktails out the door until 2023 in Seattle. So if we're doing uh, a bottled Rob Roy, for instance, depending on the whiskey that's in, that we're using in there, we'll adjust the, um, the dilution rate. So we add dilution and then say, if a guest is like, I like to drink it on the rocks, then we will lower the dilution that's in the bottle. So, because we know when they go home, they're going to put it on the rocks. So we will, I will taste through whiskeys just to get the experience of what the guest is going to have, you know, as much as like with some of these whiskeys, I want to be like, just maybe just have it neat, you know, or maybe, you know, add a couple of drops of water if you want. But a lot of people, like to drink their whiskey on the rocks and and that's okay so i want to make sure that you know i'm able to provide a good experience and they're not just getting like this watered down you know cocktail or or whiskey on the rocks you know so situation. you have to plan for the uh the ice even when you're not adding the ice when it comes to to go cocktails yeah so Definitely. uh uh, the one thing I wanted to ask uh, when all these different considerations for ice, that some of which you've just named, um, we kind of have the maybe insufferable term ice program um, <laughs> that different bars have. Um, and uh, could you talk us through, first of all, how would you define an ice program? Does ice matter for a bar? I think, spoiler, it probably does. But um, <laughs> and, uh, and what is your ice program at some uh, of your bars? 
an ice program definitely matters and you know you can call it whatever you want but if you're running a a hospitality business you need to have separate programs i think right you need your cocktail program you need your front of house hospitality program you need your food program you need your ice program so that you in or if you call these things programs then it opens up the doors to be like we need to train on this thing and so it's all separate like avenues for training and learning and and discussions with the guests so we do have ice programs in fact i just did a pop-up dinner with a chef that I worked with years ago, Chef Sabrina Tinsley. She's amazing. Th 13 years ago was the last time I saw her, but we did a pairing dinner together. And the old memes of like years ago came true that I was like, I'm I'm going to bring my own ice. So I took my own ice to do the pairing dinner, um, which was important because they, her place is mostly wine focused and they have ice, you know, but they didn't, I wanted large cubes and, uh, so I was that mixologist and I brought my own eyes. <laughs> uh, it was really funny. We joked about it for a long time. Um, but yeah, Rob Roy, we, we, you know, it's evolved over the years and um, we started off just, um, there's a machine called a Klein Bell machine, which is a large ice machine that produces a, I want to say it's 350 pounds or 300 pounds ish around there. Right. Camper, something like that. Yeah, 300, I think. 300. Okay. So we used to just get that giant block of ice delivered to Rob Roy. And from there, we would use a chainsaw, slice it like bread, essentially, um, and then cut it down even further and, you know, do diamonds or cubes. Um, and that kind of kicked off our ice program, calling it an ice program. Um, now we have a really great company in town called Creative Ice that they actually are ice sculptors and they're like global award winning ice sculptors, but you know, they saw their little, it's like their vodka is selling ice cubes to us is like us, me selling vodka at my bar. It's what pays the bills for them. So we get, uh, now they have what they call the Rob Roy stick because I've worked with them for over 10 years. So on their website, anyone in the Seattle area can order the Rob Roy stick, which is a two by two by 10 um, stick that we get from there so that we can still do a little bit of the show in front of guests by cutting it down but it's a lot more manageable and they deliver it in food safe sleeves and it fits in our freezer really nicely. And now my bartenders don't have to wield chainsaws um, to for prep, which is great. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we do have our, we had just have our Hosezaki Hosezaki ice machine. Um, and it is like the quarter cube. It's not even a full like, so there's an ice machine called Cold Draft that got really popular. And it's like the, the big cubes of ice, like salt. Well, you hope for them to be solid cubes of ice. Um, Rob Roy is so old. It was built, oh, so old. But I mean, it was built in 2004 um, because it was an existing bar before I bought it. So the, they sort of built the bar around the equipment. So the only ice machine that I can get that fits, I can't get like a full size cuber to fit where I need it to. So we have what some people call pillow ice, but it's dense. It's completely clear. It's not hotel ice. It's like somewhere in between. So part of our ice program is training my employees on how to shake using that ice, how to stir using that ice. Um, I've honestly found over the years, it's way better on their bodies because it's not as heavy as cold draft. So now when bartenders beg for cold draft, I'm like, hold on, let's do a workshop. Let's teach you how to use, like you can get dilution and you know, you can make a proper cocktail with this ice if you know how. Uh, anyway, and then we, you know, we have shaved ice, crushed ice, um, the whole, we run the whole, the whole gamut of ice, except for we don't have um, cooler, made in a cooler in a freezer, a camper English's method <laughs> ice. Um, so yeah. yeah I mean, we, outsource that to the to the big companies now and that's a move we've seen i think in a lot of cities uh people had to cut up their own ice but now it can be outsourced with the specialty cocktail ice providers uh, that we find in most big cities uh, san francisco has several of them plus there are bars that own those big klein bell machines that make the 300 pound blocks of ice and uh, the reason for those listening um, is there isn't an ice machine available in America that makes like a two, two inch by two inch cube that just comes out of a machine. Uh, an inch and a quarter uh, is about the, the limit, I believe, for ice machines uh, in the United States. 
And so all of this is compensating for the fact that there, there isn't that machine that just plops out those nice big cubes that we find in uh, cocktail bars or, or in the glass of water that I'm drinking right now um, <laughs> that uh, I made at home. And um, so I think we can, uh, with that transition, uh, let's talk about uh, making ice at home. So that Kleinbell machine uh, that Anu was talking about uh, makes clear big blocks of ice. And that clarity is uh, an important factor in that ice. It, it looks a lot better. But uh, until um, essentially I figured it out <laughs> a little over a decade ago, people didn't, uh, weren't able to make clear ice at home. If we think about our typical ice cube tray, it comes out and there's a cloudy uh, part, usually in the middle of the cube. And the reason for that is when water freezes into ice, it makes an ice crystal lattice. And in an ice cube tray that's on all the sides because it's cold on all sides of your freezer, and it pushes away the trapped air and any like, minerals or other impurities in that water away from the point of freezing. And so the last part to freeze is where all the cloudy parts of that cube are. But if we think like a, a skating pond that's often very clear and beautiful, that's freezing really just from the, the top down and it's pushing the air and impurities into the water beneath it. So the way I figured out to easily replicate that at home is just to take a cooler, <laughs> um, hard-sided cooler, doesn't need to be that big and fill it with water and uh, leave the top off of it and put it into your freezer. And so now because of the insulated sides and bottom that uh, water is going to freeze from the top down and push any trapped air and impurities to the bottom of that block. We all heard, I think, the, the rumor that you can just boil the water and you get perfect ice. It's just not true. <laughs> um, uh, we can try it if you haven't, if you don't believe me, boil your water as long as you want. Uh, you're never gonna get a perfectly clear cube. And in this cooler system, which we call directional freezing, it sort of became known that way because we're freezing from one direction. Um, the, it's still cloudy, but it's cloudy where we want it at the bottom. Or if we don't let that ice freeze all the way to the bottom, we'll have, I'm going to pull out a slab of ice here. <laughs> a uh, money a shot. slab of ice that was sitting in a cooler for three days. And you might be able to tell on camera, but the bottom part of this is a little bit cloudy. Um, and the top is crystal clear. And if I had let this freeze another day, all the rest that would freeze beneath it would have been very cloudy. And we can just uh, cut that part off after we make the block. And that's kind of the fun part. Uh, I use a three prong ice pick and I uh, just go to town on that block of ice making fun shapes. And um, a lot of people want square ice cubes and that's fine. There are a lot of YouTube videos on how to do that. Um, and that's, that's some of the fun. I think of making clear ice at home kind of like arts and crafts, uh, but it's, nearly free um, it's a, and you get to drink uh, your whiskey on that ice afterwards. So uh, that is super good fun. Um, and speaking of um, arts and crafts or hacking the ice apart, <laughs> that brings us back to Aaron, author of Hacking Whiskey. Oh, who thank has you. Some, uh, ice hacks. I wonder if you could tell us about some, some stuff you've done or stuff you've uh, seen, even if it's not in the book with, with ice to, um, have similar fun. Yeah, I think one of the most fun ones now that you're seeing at a lot of bars, which is very easy to do at home, is freezing something that's not water or, you know, not, you know, pure water, you know, coconut water, for instance, uh, make a rum old fashioned with a big cube of coconut water. You're getting you're getting multiple cocktails as it as it dilutes. That's a, a cool thing that I like and that obviously anyone can do at home. Um, you mentioned earlier, not on this, but off air, about smoking ice, which is a little silly. But uh, Steve Racklin, the uh, barbecue, barbecue whiz, he uh, he literally smokes his ice. And uh, it took him a while to solve this one, believe it or not. He was smoking his ice and it kept melting. And then he realized, oh, I can just smoke water and melt and then uh, freeze it. Um, 
you know, that's a pretty cool way. Uh, you know, smoke, smoked old fashions have kind of gone out of style in, in certain quarters, but in other quarters, they're the hottest cocktails around. So that's a real easy way to always have kind of a smoke bomb in your fridge you can use to make a, a smoky old fashioned or whatnot. You know, those are two of the bigger hacks that I've seen recently. What about you? Um, well, beyond that, well, on Instagram, let me tell you, it is amazing. The the ice nerds of Instagram, if, if we look at the hashtags for uh, clear ice or directional freezing or um, garnish game, sometimes you get all sorts of things for that. Um, or clear ice week, because of course there's clear ice week on Instagram. Uh, you come up with everybody's home projects, uh, making uh, ice into uh, cool shapes. You're freezing uh, flowers or mint yeah. leaves and stuff inside cubes. If you're making clear ice, those look really good because the whatever you freeze inside really stands out. Um, and um, I've also seen people doing patterned ice now. So you make your clear ice and then you press it against something that maybe it's grid lines or, or wavy lines. And when you put that in a, a tall highball glass that looks super cool until you pour something on it and then, and then the lines uh, disintegrate as well as people are actually making a lot of clear ice making products uh, for consumers now sure. one that just came out is this fun thing it just uses the the cooler technique but with a strong silicone tray with holes in the bottom so uh as your water freezes <laughs> in, in the cooler, uh, the cloudy parts get pushed out of the holes and just remain in the cooler beneath it. And you have great big um, crystal clear ice cubes. And that's um, some of the innovations, I, I suppose, in products that people are doing around ice. And with those trays, you can freeze all sorts of stuff inside of them. Um, that's really fun. Uh, although it's hard to make them, you think colored ice would be kind of fun that way, but much how a water treats air as an impurity. It treats anything uh, colored as an, as an impurity as well. And so you can put all the blue food coloring you want inside of your cooler, but you'll have just blue on the bottom and the clear ice on the top still. Uh, so for I, colored ice, you might want to just stick to the typical ice cube tray. I like when you just freeze a toy in ice and put it on or like a Barbie head or something weird. I like when you do that. Yeah, now every holiday is an excuse for me to go to the, the drugstore or the toy store and like look for things smaller than a two-inch cube to freeze into an ice cube. Halloween is the best holiday, I think, for all circumstances. The best ice holiday, yeah. <laughs> but particularly for, for ice cubes. Yeah, the one that you did with the knife. Was it the knife or the hand? Both, probably. Wow. <laughs> yes. Those are uh, a severed hand from the Halloween Superstore uh, that uh, in it frozen in an ice block. I was I was pretty proud of that one. Thanks for, for appreciating <laughs> it. Um, so once we've made our ice, I mean, I wonder if you could tell us. Uh, so I think I ha have at least experienced the ice that tastes like garlic or pizza in, in the freezer. So um, how do we avoid that? For home use? Uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So one thing I like to tell people when I'm teaching cocktail classes is um, you can buy ice from us. Hey, come to the bar and just buy bags of ice and then put it in your freezer. Uh, the other thing is you can actually, depending on your ice maker, um, you can put a bag around where the ice is going to fall out. So it's immediately falling into like a Ziploc bag or a bigger plastic bag. Um, you kind of have to monitor it so that you can pull it off and then just tie it off. So it's like straight from the machine, which again, depending on your freezer at home, might be getting the sense from your freezer. Um, the other thing is that, especially when you're going to have a party, you know, most at home ice makers can't keep up with your party guests because they're not producing like an industrial one. Um, so, you know, a day before, two days before, um, just start bagging your ice immediately, put it in Ziplocs and then just seal it and keep it in your freezer. Um, so, you know, the last thing you want is when you are grabbing your ice from your freezer um, or getting it out of the uh, door, whatever it is, and it comes out like like it's wearing a sweater. You know what I mean? It's like wearing a white furry sweater and you're like, 
well, that's not exactly what I want. But if you put it in a bag immediately and you're going to use it, you know, that's a good way to, to go through it. Then if you're not going to use that all, all that ice at the end of your party, put it in your plants. There's no need to waste your water, but it's a good way to water your plants with that icky ice that you don't want to be ingesting. <laughs> Uh, one one friend told me this was back in our younger days. Uh, the trick to getting everyone to leave your party is to secretly throw out all the ice because <laughs> no one's going to want to drink warm vodka or whatever at, at your party. That's another ice tip from the pros. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, one thing I do, so I, I also keep all of my ice in my freezer. Um, I keep it in Ziplocs, as you say, uh, mostly the, the bags, but sometimes the, the solid containers, if I have nice big cubes and I'll stack them there, they'll look uh, really pretty. But another thing you can do is just don't have, um, don't throw the box of pizza in your, in your fridge because the scents from your refrigerator also uh, go through the freezer. And then you have uh, ice that tastes like pizza, which sounds like it would be a good thing, but in my experience, uh, not so much. Um, I think you might have just inspired a new trend. You know how we, well, I think a lot of cocktail bars zest lemon in their egg containers. So when we're doing egg whites, you get the smell of the lemon. It sort of takes out that cardboardy aspect of egg white. Are we? I think maybe we should start zet, putting lemon zest in our bags of ice so that they're like lightly... Lemon scented ice is the next trend. I'm calling it right now. Sweet. I will look forward <laughs> to all my zested, zesty drinks at Rob Roy. Um, I am long overdue for a repeat visit. That is for sure. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so one thing that um, we talked in the beginning of this about uh, chilling our whiskey, that ice does uh, the job of chilling and dilution and numbing the palate. Um, but there are other ways to enjoy our whiskey cold, but not necessarily dilute. And uh, what I'm talking about is whiskey stones uh, right now, uh, which, uh, Aaron, I, I don't, I'm going to guess that you too, as a journalist, have been sent one or two of these whiskey stones over the years. Yeah, I think in my book I said I, I could fill a fishbowl with what I've been sent. Um, not a fan, obviously. I don't really like granite stones rushing towards my face as I'm trying to relax and enjoy a drink. So, you know, I'm all out on uh, whiskey, uh, whiskey stones. Yeah. I admit I'm afraid of them <laughs> as well. Like the, the rocks coming at my teeth are uh, scary. I did a story um, many years ago for Whiskey Advocate and I compared the various versions of whiskey stones because they have some that are like metallic dice um, mm -hmm. looking. They're not granite and um, everything correlated basically with the size of the stone that you are dropping into your whiskey. Uh, but then I tried just putting a glass in the freezer for a yeah. few minutes first and turns out that works great <laughs> and uh, there's no objects in your whiskey there to um, hit you in the teeth. So that's a, another easy way to chill without diluting our whiskey. And without injury. And without injury. No one, no one that's wants to. That's an embarrassing injury. Yeah. No, but I suppose it's a worker, worker's compensation for, for any of us here. Yeah. I didn't think <laughs> about that. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about, um, shapes of ice. Uh, I was wondering if we could talk a bit more. When we talk about whiskey drinks, uh, an old fashioned um, is now, I think, in better cocktail bars, typically served on one big cube of ice. But uh, other drinks are served on, on different types, which may not be that different. Uh, uh, anu, I wonder if you could tell us the uh, what's the difference between a mint julep and an old fashioned and, and then the ice in that situation? I mean, that's essentially the difference between those two drinks is essentially the ice, right? Uh, maybe one's a little bit sweeter. One has mint, um, but it really is the ice. So you're doing crushed ice in a mint julep and you're doing a large rock um, in the old fashioned. Some places you'll get just cubes of ice in your old fashioned. But yeah, with um, again, right, this is another topic I think we could talk about forever is dilution rates. 
a lot of people think if it's crushed ice, it's going to dilute it much faster. However, if you're packing that crushed ice into a metal tin cup, uh, it's probably going to melt pretty slow. But you have a straw in there, so you're going to drink the whiskey up through the ice cave that forms anyways really fast before that ice ever melts. Um, you know, and then if you're standing outside on at, during the Kentucky Derby and it's hot, then maybe you're going to get a little more dilution. Um, but yeah, that's typically the difference uh, between those two drinks. And for me, right, I mean, Camper, we could talk about Rob Roy's, okay, for the temperature in Rob Roy changes so dramatically from the time we open to 11 p.m. when it's packed and it's hot and it's sweaty in there. So as much as we try to control how much dilution people are going to get in their drinks, um, you know, we, we specifically want a large rock in our old fashions. It's going to change depending on the time of night that somebody is in our bar. But so are, you know, sobriety levels <laughs> as they're in the bar and, and, you know, are they moving around the room with the hot hands on the cup? Um, so we, you know, we try to choose the best piece of ice or the best shape of ice for the cocktail knowing that that's going to happen, right? Because the bar setting is completely different than drinking at home. So you might come and have a drink at Rob Roy on a large cube and then try to mimic that exact same drink at home and 20 minutes later be like, man, this is a really stiff drink. Like it just doesn't have enough dilution. And it's yeah, have, in a hot bar. Often I, I feel like this is a, a New York issue, Aaron. We'll have to see if uh, you agree that they're doing everything so right that the drinks are a little bit wrong uh, and that the glassware is kept in a freezer and then the great big uh, spheres of ice and spheres have the lowest surface area to volume of any shape. Therefore, uh, because ice melts on the outside, there's the least dilution per, um, per volume of, of ice there. So uh, if we don't want the ice to melt quickly, we, a big sphere of ice is the ideal shape. But uh, if we take that and then put it into a frozen glass and um, stir, pour, pour an old fashioned over it, we might be kind of waiting a while for it to dilute enough. And um, I, I guess it's something I, I most have experienced uh, in New York bars, but maybe that's because I'm not from there and I'm really paying attention <laughs> to find uh, to find flaws with, with that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've never noticed that. I obviously find flaws with everywhere but New York. So <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly there's nothing wrong with San Francisco bars. <laughs> of course not. You know, I've noticed Seattle. that with a lot of bars that... Um, you're right. It's like people are trying to do things too right or what they think is right, you know, just being like super technical on every single point. But then they're almost missing the point. Um, I've actually gotten asked this question a lot. Why don't we chill the double fashion glass that we put our Rob Roy in? Um, because I don't I personally don't think the old fashioned should be like a super cold drink. Right. Um, I think it should be, you know, not room temp somewhere in between. And then we do our, you know, our big block of ice on it. So I've had, you know, very technical mixologists come at me with like, why isn't this glass chilled? And yeah, you know, the, it all comes down to personal preference, but you're right. Cause like some, you might be sitting too long with that drink before you get the yeah. perfect experience. The, the chilled glass for me drink is obviously the Sazerac, not the old fashioned, which is an iceless drink most often. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, that's perfect that way. Yeah, much like we freeze in an up cocktail glass, like a mar martini, martini glass, yeah. um, uh, to keep the, the glass cold because there's not going to be uh, ice in it. And that's, uh, I think, uh, a real interesting thing that people don't think about with bars that much is that based on the ice machine that you have, the treatment of the drinks might be quite different. Um, if there's a, a bar that they shake the drinks for only a, only a few seconds and it sounds kind of watery really fast, probably they have that hotel ice. And hotel ice, uh, for those people watching, is it's the version of the absolute worst ice. That means hotel ice is the worst. Um, uh, just the small and the crescents on, and it melts instantly like it does for your soda. Um, and uh, other people are obsessed with the crunchiness of ice and the, um, the uh, made by other machines or the sonic ice uh, made at the uh, 
uh, people will go and buy bags of ice by the pound at uh, takeout places to have uh, crunchable ice, which um, it's good if you're into it, <laughs> I suppose. Um, it sounds painful to me, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's not it's not my jam. Uh, but then again, it doesn't get all that warm in San Francisco, <laughs> usually even in the summer. Um, so I, I crave less of that snowy uh, snow cone ice than other people. Uh, I did see that someone uh, mentioned in the comments using the butterfly uh, pea flower tea in ice cubes. And that's um, a tea that turns blue. Uh, and then when citrus is added to it, it it turns towards a, a pinkish purple. And uh, as mentioned, yeah, that's a great trip to do in ice cubes because uh, the drink is one color and as the ice melts from blue, it'll change the entire color of the drink. And we have, you know, craft magic <laughs> at our cocktail bars. I was just gonna check, uh, don't have any questions in the chat just yet. Um, and another thing um, that probably few people realize is that different countries have different ice machines and uh, that can be so different that everything about the, the cocktails, how they're made has to be different. Uh, Japan is, is a big one in that all the bars that, that I've been into, which are mostly small craft cocktail bars, they don't have ice machines in the bar. They have daily ice delivery and it comes uh, basically in a, in a, a cooler and it's random shapes all very clear but all different sizes together and when we think of the amazing skill of japanese bartending that's usually a lot of ice handling <clears throat> in the ice with the the tongs and uh, cutting down ice to shake certain sizes but uh and i always thought that was just being finicky but uh, a a lot of it comes from just the ice that's available <laughs> in Japan. You have to uh, work with a big bucket of ice and um, break it down into the size of ice that you need, processing to order, which is uh, pretty interesting. While uh, in Europe, not only do some countries have a preference for less ice in their cocktails in general, um, a, like a warm gin and tonic with two Dying cubes is is the still the gold standard uh, in a lot of the UK. Sure. Other places have more delivery focused or less delivery focused ice services there. Um, is there are there any um, tips, additional tips or tricks that you guys want to share, or anything to think about with ice, um, either at home or at the bar, while I take this moment to sip my whiskey on ice. Yes. Well, you know, I will say one, the easiest thing, or the one thing that's easily overlooked is when you're making a drink at home and you want to strain a cocktail over ice in a glass is like, say it's a Tom Collins style drink or something tall is just making sure to pack the glass with ice, just putting enough ice in there. Um, your drink shouldn't overflow. It should be fine. If you're doing the right proportions of cocktail, um, because I see a lot of um, when I've gone to, you know, people's homes or their Instagram photos or whatever, where you just see the ice kind of floating at the top of the, the drink in the cocktail glass. So it's just make sure you're packing that glass with with ice um, to make a, a good drink. But when you're drinking it on the rocks, you know, uh, whiskey specifically, because the title of this seminar <laughs> On the rocks. Um, yeah, I think my only tip is to just bag your ice so that it doesn't get smells from your frozen pizza or whatever. And then as we were talking, I remember, do you remember there was a commercial not too long ago about a new fridge or freezer that delivered ice balls? Yes, the uh, LG Craft Ice uh, <laughs> trademark uh, freezer. And I've How did they not hire you as an influencer for that one? They hired some other people. <laughs> right, I, I was overlooked. <laughs> um, but uh, I've seen one live, uh, actually, and uh, it makes ice balls are not exactly perfect, but and it only makes a few a day. However, I would love one. <laughs> um, it's uh, uh, it's it's cool and uh, pretty, pretty uh, near perfectly clear, if not near perfectly round, a little bit bigger than ping pong balls um, shaped okay. ice. 
those come. It's uh, it's fun. I like I like where this is all going um, with those uh, yeah. freezers that can produce the ice that was hard to do at home. We did have a question in in the uh, in the chat. Uh, why would anyone recommend using crushed ice in a cocktail? And I think beyond the julep that we talked about, there are some other drinks that call for crushed or cracked sure. ice. I mean, yeah. tiki, of course, yeah. Tiki drink. Yeah. And why, And does anyone want to talk about why? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, um, again, you know, tropical drinks typically, before like the rise of tiki bars and tropical bars, were drank in tropical places uh, and then brought, you know, to the West coast and spread from there. But um, for me, if a drink has a lot of really robust flavors, you know, pineapple juice to me is really robust mixing it with like orange juice, all that citrus and all that acid um, throw in some orge out. Like those are all really big, strong, bold flavors that um, putting crushed ice on it sort of mellows. It kind of is like the glue that's binding everything together. It sort of like melds all those flavors together and makes a drink a little more palatable. Um, I'm a, I have a really dry palate. I like my whiskey neat. I like down stirred cocktails. Um, so when I'm at a place that has a tropical, you know, drink menu, they tend to be sweet. You know, we can say that they're perfectly balanced for that style of drink, but for me, they tend to be on the sweeter side. So putting it on crushed ice also sort of, you know, dilutes the sweetness of the drink and makes it a little bit more palatable for me. Right. So uh, that uh, brings up a great point that also I don't think non-bartenders know about blender drinks. Um, they tend to have more sugar in it than the equivalent drink not blended. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah anything in a, like the swirly slushy machines, uh, in order to get that slushy consistency, we have to up the sugar content. So if you have your little bricks uh, measuring device uh, and you do that side by side with another cocktail, like the same cocktail, if there's if it's on the menu, right, say a pina colada made fresh or the pina colada in the slushy machine, the one in the slushy machine is going to have more sugar in order to get that consistency. Right. But it'll taste about the same because of the the palate uh, effect, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're right. Uh, I'm going to have to test that now. But you're right. The numbing effect of ice, you know, the coldness of the slushy versus it, the same drink on the rocks, definitely. Uh, let's talk about swizzles. <laughs> um, the uh, swizzles are a, a style of tropical drink um, where... I, I wish I had one in my, in my hand. Or a swizzle stick, as we think of it, is a souvenir from a bar that has the, the name of the bar on it, a, plas a plastic tchotchke. But uh, one, an original swizzle stick is a, is a stick that starts to branch off and those branches are cut. Um, and so that is put um, down into the drink that's filled with uh, crushed ice and, and swirled in your hands to swirl that, swirl that ice. And that's a specific tech, uh, type of cocktail where we would also um, use crushed ice in the drink. And what that gives us beyond mixing the drink together is a nice frosty glass, which can be a terrific experience on hot days or in um, you know, tropical settings of uh, uh, tropical bars, which is another uh, reason the mint julep can be so satisfying. It's a uh, metal container which conducts the um, the heat better, and so it's our hand uh, has a nice experience in addition to our mouth. <laughs> I guess in a mint julep, I've never put it that way before. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, whistling um, ice is a good way to get. Uh, if you want, like if you swizzle long enough, right, you can get maybe a little more dilution. Um, if say you don't have a shaker tin or a way to shake a drink, then the next best option would be to swizzle it. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think we've um, covered our um, main topics and material. We covered actually a lot of uh, ice material in a really short amount of time. Uh, on this talk, which is good because my ice has mostly melted in my whiskey that I've been having here under the hot lights of the uh, of the the beverage chat room. So um, I will um, 
Thank you for uh, joining us um, on this chat about Whiskey on the Rocks. And uh, I want to let people know about uh, future talks uh, for beverage. And uh, coming up uh, next week, I think panelists might be changing a bit, but uh, we're looking at Tennessee Whiskey. And uh, I believe Nicole Austin from uh, George Dickel uh, has confirmed for the talk, and she is uh, a brilliant uh, leader and distiller. She's the general manager of Cascade Hollow um, Whiskey Company, which produces George Dickel, but also makes whiskey for other companies. And she has a very uh, unique and important job um, that uh, we'll hear all about uh, a week from now or any time in the future that you should happen to watch uh, this chat on another channel. And uh, with that, I uh, see no more questions. So I will once again uh, thank the panelists for joining us. I will invite the people watching to join for future uh, chats. Uh, there are more being scheduled for months ahead and more tasting kits to come uh, beyond this initial one for American single malt whiskeys. So thank you for uh, joining us, everyone, and uh, have a great night and enjoy your ice. <laughs>